Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, we are about to hear Professor Valerie Hoffman about Sufism for our time. So please um, join me in giving Professor Valerie Hoffman a warm welcome. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So, the numerous violent attacks on Sufi mosques and shrines across the Muslim world in recent years are only, of course, the latest assault on Sufis and Sufism in the modern period. Modernists and secularists criticize Sufism as superstitious, backward, and irrational. Salafis condemn Sufis as unbelievers and sometimes resort to violence. Government agencies have sometimes advocated promoting Sufism as an antidote to Salafism, though not all who oppose Salafism would necessarily embrace Sufism, and Sufism has not always been pacifistic or apolitical. Indeed, among the responses to attacks on Sufi shrines in Egypt in 2011 uh, was the formation of Sufi political parties and calls for Sufi militias to guard the shrines. Nonetheless, Sufis point out the contrast between their focus on inner transformation and the Salafi resort to legalism and force. Furthermore, some Sufis have ventured far beyond the common boundaries of Sufi thought to advocate new ways of thinking about religious identity and its role in society. And despite Salafism's significant victories in recent decades, Sufism remains a potent force in society with continued appeal. And this is an article from Al Monitor from last July, Egypt's Millennials Turn to Sufism. <laughs> In this paper, I will discuss the Egyptian Society for Spiritual and Cultural Research, the acronym, very awkward, the ESSCR, which is not a Sufi order, but is founded on the basis of the teachings of a Sufi spiritualist, Rafa, Muhammad Rafa, um, and is currently led by his eldest son, Dr. Ahmed Abdel Wahid Rafa, who is known as a Sayyid Ali Rafa, um, and he is a professor of computer science at the American University in Cairo. While two of his sisters, Dr. Ali Rafa, a professor of anthropology at Ain Shams University, and Aisha Rafa, a journalist, lead a women's section. Both Alia and Aisha are prolific writers who have been interviewed in the Egyptian media and have participated in international conferences. And parenthetically, I may note that Alia is the wife of Dr. Adel El Beltagi, the Egyptian Minister of Agriculture. So the ESSCR describes its mission as follows. Emanating from the belief that people are spiritual beings with material bodies, the Egyptian Society for Spiritual and Cultural Research directs its efforts to awaken this consciousness among people by propagating spiritual knowledge that people need in every culture and religion. We strive to learn from any source of spiritual knowledge, old or new, Eastern or Western, that offers people knowledge about themselves as, human, as spiritual beings and about humanity's highest goal in life and the corresponding moral path according to which we should live. We find the roots of this knowledge in the natural religions, the heavenly religions, which of course would usually mean the revealed religions, Judaism and Christianity in particular, and human experiences in different cultures and beliefs. Among the fundamental understandings and beliefs of the ESSCR are the following. People cannot benefit from religious teachings until they develop and purify their intellect, heart, and body. Connection to the sacred inside oneself yields harmony with the spirit of all sacred teachings. A person's spiritual development is reflected in daily life, coloring it with peace, love, and service. All heavenly and natural messages provide spiritual training that helps develop consciousness of one's spiritual nature. All spiritual messages came to free people from illusions that can obstruct spiritual development. All spiritual messages encourage people to live a life of justice and equality. And finally, there is support for all of the aforementioned points in the teachings of Islam. 
So corresponding to these understandings are some moral principles. Every person has the freedom and right to choose a path for spiritual development. No one has the right to judge other people's beliefs or to impose any particular belief on others. The followers of any particular religion have no right to feel superior to others. The ESSCR emphasizes religious pluralism and interfaith cooperation. Its primary teaching is that all religions, even polytheistic ones, have as their source and focus the same absolute reality, and that the purpose of all revelations is to experience and act in harmony with the element of divinity that is within each person. All religions grew out of the one primordial religion, Din al-Fitra, but have deviated from the truth because of legalism, dogmatism, and ethnocentrism. Interestingly, not because of wrong theology. Activities of the ESSCR include regular meetings for prayer, Sufi dhikr, teaching, study, and discussion, the publication of books and journals, um, conferences, uh, they, organize, they offer a what they call a spiritual training system, they have a children's program, and they have centers in many major Egyptian cities, including Cairo, Helwan, Alexandria, and Aswan. Um, the group describes itself as subscribing to a path that has been followed since the beginning of creation. The group's website outlines four phases in its development, beginning with the life of Sayyid Rafi Muhammad Rafi. In typical hagiographic fashion, Sayyid Rafi's online biography stresses his good family and his descent from the Prophet. When he was only 20 days old, the website says, he could focus on his mother's face. He was a distinguished child, bright, sensitive, and peaceful. His mother noticed that there was something special about the boy, so she treated him with special care. Since his early childhood and throughout his earthly life, he was a person who respected the intellect and the independence of the personality. I'm quoting from the website, by the way. <laughs> um, he strove to serve people, driven by love and purity in his dealings with all. He chose law as his profession so he could defend the rights of the working classes who struggled for a dignified life. He chose to work in politics in the 1920s and 30s uh, so he could participate in the national movement that defended the right of Egyptian society to be free of British imperialism. But he became disillusioned with the lack of altruism among politicians and abandoned politics for humanitarian and spiritual work. He married a descendant of the well-known um, uh, reformer Rafa'a Tahtawi, who was also a descendant of the Prophet, and on the first day after his marriage, Sayyid Rafa felt a new spiritual birth and understood that his wife had a role in this. Since then, he started observing his prayers, although his, his observance up until then had been irregular. He abruptly cut himself off from social commitments and had a great desire to meditate and evaluate the meaning of life. He began to have regular visionary experiences, including one in which a jewel with the words Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, descended upon him from heaven and penetrated his heart. When he awoke, he found his heart calling the name of Allah and a fragrant scent emanating from his hand, which remained for several days. Learning through visions became a common practice for him. And so, according to the ESSCR website, Sayyid Rafer found himself on the Sufi path, which encourages people to purify their souls in order to receive God's words with all their being and to hear them from within the heart and live them in a life overflowing with love for all members of the human family. When we speak of Sufism, the website clarifies, we speak of the sheikhs who had awareness of this aspect, such as Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn Atta'Allah, and others. We do not speak of those who are Sufi only in appearance. A visionary experience led him to an illiterate Shadali ascetic, uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahid, 
who denied his worthiness to be Rafa's teacher, claiming that he himself was destined for hellfire, whereas Rafa was a descendant of the prophet and had an unattainable spiritual level. But now that I have met you, he said, you are my savior. Let us take an oath that whichever one of us is saved will help the other and save him. The sheikh moved into Rafa's home in Halwan and told his disciples that Rafa would renew the order. So a new phase then in Sayyid Rafa's spiritual life came when he attended a meeting of a spiritualist association. Now I have to, uh, because spiritualism isn't something that's so frequently discussed anymore, I want to explain. Spiritualism doesn't mean to be spiritual. It, it refers to contact with the spirits of the dead. Okay, that's what spiritualism is. So um, he, he attended a meeting of a spiritualist association led by Sayyid Ahmed Abu Khair, uh, where a Native American spirit guide named Silver Birch spoke through a medium named Sayyid Muhammad Eid Gharib. Now this was all new to me. When I first learned about this, I really didn't know very much about spiritualism. It turns out Silver Birch is very famous. <laughs> Silver Birch um, was made famous through the Hannan Swaffer Home Circle in London in the early 20th century, where Maurice Barbanel served as the medium. And you can see a publication, one of many books of teachings of Silver Birch, sayings of Silver Birch. According to Sayyid Rafa's biography, Silver Birch appointed him as leader of the group. And the ESSER website says that Rafa found that Silver Birch's guidance was in harmony with the spirit and essence of all heavenly and natural fitri spiritual messages, whose teachings had been changed by their followers into fixed ideas, practices, and traditions that led to factionalism and fanaticism. According to Sayyid Rafa, Master Silver Birch said, we strive to clarify the sound religious foundations on which connections must be based between people and their Lord and between a man and his brother in humanity. We bring you back to the fitra from which sprang all the heavenly religions and from which all godly truths are derived. The hearts of those of us who are in the world of the spirit are filled with sadness and grief because of those who pass their earthly lives without filling their quivers with goodness and sound deeds in preparation for what they will encounter in the world of the spirit, where happiness and rest are for the righteous person who does good and misery and pain for the corrupt who immerse themselves in evil. Now, despite the prevalence of visions and visionary contact in Egyptian Sufism, Sayyid Rafa's adherence to the teachings of a spirit guide who had allegedly had numerous earthly lives and chose to identify himself uh, by a Native American identity he had had 3,000 years earlier may be somewhat surprising. As Jane Smith pointed out in a 1980 article on concourse between the living and the dead, Egypt was the center of Islamic spiritualist interpretation for over a century. Drawing on the ideas of European and American spiritualists of the 19th and early 20th centuries, Egyptian spiritualists argued for the compatibility of spiritualism with Islamic teachings, and that spiritualism is empirically proven by its practitioners' experiments. Muhammad Farid Wagdi, the editor of Al Hayat and publisher of the uh, magazine of Al Azhar University, the, uh, you know, the Islamic University, believed in spiritualism. And the statements of prominent scholars of Al Azhar in the mid 20th century, such as Egypt's Mufti, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Hassanin Makhlouf, are seen as supportive of spiritualism. Nonetheless, Sheikh Abdul Wahid was displeased with Sayyid Rafa's turn towards spiritualism, and the group that had formed around the two men split over this issue. Sayyid Rafa formed a new group in the early 1950s, the Islamic Spiritual Society, which observed Sufi practices while also being open to spiritual connection and um, had contemplative sessions. Rafa believed that spiritual connection frees the spirit from the prison of matter so it can travel into the infinite realm of God Almighty. It is God's hand extended to free minds, souls, and spirits from the prisons of their fa phantoms, ashbach, 
to remove the veil from them so they can understand previously hidden matters in their present and future and in this way lead them to happiness. Spiritualism, he said, doesn't bring a new message, rituals, or organization of information, but it awakens the mind to the pure truth that all the prophets had brought. The Islamic Spiritual Society also offered free spiritual healing services through a healing spirit, also Native American, named White Eagle. Spiritual lodges channeling the power of White Eagle continue to exist in England, Australia, and the United States. Sayyid Rafi believed that Islam is a message of love that embraces all of humanity without distinctions based on religious affiliation. It is perhaps noteworthy that uh, his biography is included in a collection of spiritualist stories assembled by Karen Sawyer and published in 2008. Sayyid Rafer died in July 1970, uh, designating his eldest son, who is known as Sayyid Ali Rafer, as his successor, and so the group entered its third phase. For six years, the group continued to receive guidance from Silver Birch through the medium, Muhammad Aid Gharib. Silver Birch asked the members of the group to renew their oath to Sayyid Ali as their leader. Ali Rafa accepted the role in only a limited fashion, rejecting the traditional role of a Sufi sheikh. He rather felt that all of the, the entire group were brothers and sisters in the path of God and that they all could guide each other. Hence, the traditional sheikh-disciple relationship was eliminated. When Muhammad Gharib died in 1976 and no new medium emerged to take his place, spiritual connection with the deceased ceased to play an active role in the group, which now focused on teaching sessions um, and Sufi dhikr. In 1980, when the Egyptian state um, passed new laws regarding voluntary associations, Sayyid Ali registered the group as the Egyptian Society for Spiritual and Cultural Research. Um, its research consists of, they, uh, they do research about the teachings of various religions and um, they uh, share this research with each other. They in, try to show that all of these different religions are multiple forms of the one primordial religion. And they believe that uh, surrender to the supreme power and the eternal laws of life frees the individual to purify the soul, reach his or her spiritual potential, and be open to love, which is the foundation of life. With his two sisters, Alia and, Ra and Aisha, or should I say two of his sisters, they have a large family, Ali Rafer has published books in both English and Arabic. Beyond Diversities, Reflections on Revelations was published in English in 2000 and in Arabic in 2005, interestingly. Um, this book expounds on the meaning of the one primordial religion and includes foundational texts from ancient Egyptian religion, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, demonstrating how each faith tradition serves the purpose of the primordial religion and that each one is a vehicle to purification and spiritual growth. Um, Islam from Adam to Muhammad and Beyond, which was uh, it published in 2004 and then republished in 2005 as the Book of Essential Islam, the Spiritual Training System of Islam, and then translated into Arabic and published in 2007, demonstrates that the message of the single primordial religion is fully manifest in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, that it's a universal message intended for the whole world while respecting diversity as a fundamental law of existence, a sunnah, and respecting freedom of belief as an essential right. The universality of Islam, according to the authors, does not intend to cancel the diversity of religions or impose a single um, form of religious practice on all of humanity, but it is a call to awaken the common spiritual root of humanity and bring harmony with the eternal law of life. They say, uh, they demonstrate this by quoting a multitude of Quranic verses and hadiths, and they say that the uh, word Islam 
in the Quran does not refer exclusively to the practices of the followers of Muhammad, but to submission to God in the broader sense. The book also, in a typical Sufi fashion, describes the spiritual meaning behind various ritual practices, including um, the circumambulation of, of the Kaaba and the, uh, the running between Safa and Marwa, other aspects of the Hajj. They, al they also argue that no gender is superior to another um, because all humanity comes from a single origin that the Sharia does not impose rigid rules, roles rather, that are to be uh, literally and strictly applied, uh, that the husband's responsibility to provide for the family is meant to allow the wife to rest during the rigors of pregnancy, nursing, and childcare, but not to imprison women in those roles or to humiliate them. Um, they also published an anthology of Sayyid Ali's uh, Friday sermons and um, audio recordings of his weekly sermons are posted online on the group's website and on his Facebook page. Divine Revelation and Human Understandings, Unlimited Horizons, published in 2015, presents the author's views on verses that they say have been used for 15 centuries to transform worship into mere forms and to make the world an enemy and make the Sharia just a bunch of rules and punishments. They want to present their view that Islam is a religion of mercy and love, a way to purify the heart from moral defects and the intellect from fanaticism, and to promote spiritual development at the level of the individual, justice at the level of society, and peace and love globally. They reject any orientation that claims to have the best understanding or to articulate absolute truth because, they say, the Quranic text and the Sunnah of the Prophet are open to unlimited rich understandings. Aisha Rafer also wrote a book titled Kun Nafsik to Kun Sa'i, Be Yourself and You'll Be Happy, um, which advocates the view that anyone can choose happiness by getting in touch with her true inner self and by training her thoughts to be constructive, good, and creative while abandoning self-blame. So in addition to the Friday prayer meetings and sermons, there are women's meetings at which Alia gives teachings assisted by Aisha. There is no sexual segregation and quite a few men attend the women's meeting. The one I attended in 2008 was striking for the age range of those in attendance as well as uh, the diversity in dress. I noticed one older man in a galabia, the traditional robe, sitting in the middle and paying rapt attention to the teaching which was about, uh, which was about criticizing uh, in interpretations that would impose gender inequality. So I thought that was quite interesting. At all the, their meetings, anyone present may ask questions and voice opinions. They also have monthly meetings at which members present the results of their research on different spiritual cultures. The group welcomes speakers from different religious traditions, including groups that are typically shunned by Muslims, such as the Baha'is. They produce an electronic journal in Arabic and English under the title A Road Home and an Arabic print and electronic journal titled Steps on the Road. Ali Arafa is extraordinarily active in multiple fora, both in Egypt and abroad. She has spoken in conferences of the Parliament of World Religions, international Sufi conferences, and this one which I have up there, conferences that focus on women's rights and development. With three other women, one Christian and two Jewish, including a former lieutenant in the Israeli Air Force, she co-authored a book titled The Root of All Evil, an Exposition of Prejudice, Fundamentalism, and Gender Imbalance. Each of the four authors wrote an introduction to explain what led her to the writing of this book. In her self-introduction, Alia recalls that fundamentalism was unknown in the Egypt of her youth and that in contrast to the anti-Semitism so prevalent in Egypt in later decades, Jews were friends and neighbors who were praised for their honesty and good service. In the early 70s, she and her husband lived for a time in Wales and they were shocked when they returned to Egypt to find a country in which fundamentalist interpretations of Islam had come to prevail. 
she uh, believed that this form of religiosity came at the expense of the true meaning of Islam. She saw the new veil that was popular among female students as an artificial and rigid type of religiosity that sought to impose a particular mindset on other people. It became my major interest, she wrote, to remove these false barriers that separate our human family and to build ties of love between humans everywhere. In a talk delivered in 2010 at Egypt's National Center for Sociological and Criminological Research, Alia spoke about women's head coverings. She noted that in the 1970s and early 80s, young women put on the hijab as an expression of religious commitment in response to their alienation from society um, due to the changes after Sadat's open door policy. But today, she said, the vast majority of women and girls cover their heads, so the hijab no longer has symbolic value, hence the turn to the niqab, the face veil. But the niqab, she says, is a security risk, and it promotes the idea that a woman's entire body is aura, is like pudenda, to be covered. It diminishes a woman's self-esteem and prevents her from taking leading roles in society. The entire trend toward preoccupation with the external trappings of religiosity at the expense of the spiritual core has produced, she said, such social ills as drug use and corruption, as well as psychological ills such as aimlessness and nihilism. We need, she said, to go back uh, to renew the reformist orientation of Rafa'a al Tahtawi and Muhammad Abdu to go back to our roots, understand our history, and reconnect with genuine spirituality. The ideas of the ESSCR may critically engage common perceptions in Egypt, but there is no sense that its members are alienated from the Egyptian mainstream. When Alia was nominated for membership in the Egyptian Association of Women Writers, she was interviewed by the women's magazine Hawa, which described her as a very distinctive woman who has a different and enlightened point of view. The fact that the ESSCR has chosen to publish in English, sometimes even before publishing in Arabic, is an indication of its self-perception as part of an international cohort of people who are both socially active and spiritually oriented. In this vein, Alia has also co-edited with two other women, a force such as the world has never known, Women Creating Change a collection of 28 first-person accounts by women from a variety of faith backgrounds and countries all over the globe who rescue, teach, and empower women and girls. Each of them speaks from a perspective of spirituality in action and refers to the divine feminine. Another of Ali's initiatives is Mu'assasat al-Bana al-Insani wa Tanmiya, the Foundation of Human Growth and Development, which is unfortunately officially translated as the Human Foundation. <laughs> um, it, this is a nonprofit that engages in social, economic, and political research, conducts training, fosters social entrepreneurship projects, and organizes lectures and uh, conferences with titles such as Women Gathering for Change, Envisioning Ways to Create a Healthier Future. So, it may seem that by now we have wandered rather far from the typical concerns of Sufism. <laughs> and indeed, the Sufi dimension is not always evident in the ESSCR's teachings. While the focus of the group is spiritual, its leaders do not hesitate to comment on questions of Quranic interpretation, the application of the Sharia, and a Muslim's social responsibilities. The Sufi dimension is nonetheless evident in its practices of dhikr and meditation. When I took a group of students from the University of Illinois to Egypt in 2008 and invited Alia and Aisha to speak to them, they paused even then for silent prayer before beginning to speak. The Sufi dimension is also evident in the group's interpretation of the spiritual meaning of Islamic rituals and its emphasis on the need to purify the soul in order to perceive the divine light. Its pluralistic orientation resembles that of some Sufi groups in the West, such as the Bawa Mahayadeen Fellowship in Philadelphia, 
On the University of Illinois campus at Urbana-Champaign, a Qadri Sheikh from India leads weekly sessions of spiritual music from all religious traditions, and his website denies attachment to any particular religious tradition, which is a contrast with the ESSCR's explicitly Islamic orientation. The promotion of world peace has sometimes been featured at international Sufi conferences. Here are examples from Fez, Morocco, and from New Delhi, with Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaking at the opening ceremony and in various contemporary Sufi groups, such as this one in Africa. It has, I say Africa in general because they have uh, centers located throughout uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So the promotion of world peace and mutual understanding is clearly an integral part of ESSCR's approach. So at this point, I want to just think about the extent to which their approach is similar to that of other contemporary Muslims. So, because there are many contemporary Muslim thinkers who've grappled with the issues of dogmatism, authoritarianism, and interpretative rigidity, and who uh, which they perceive as causing conflict and human rights abuses in the Muslim world. Uh, for example, Farid Isaq has suggested bold new interpretations of Iman, uh, Islam, and Kufr that prioritize the linkage of faith with the struggle for social justice rather than with doctrine alone. In this way, he simultaneously narrows and widens these categories because he says they're personal qualities, not social labels. And so uh, nominal Muslims who fail to struggle for justice in society, he places outside the category of Iman and Islam and in the category of Kufr. But on the other hand, he includes non-Muslims who submit to God and struggle for justice within the category of Iman and Islam and outside the category of Kufr. And he defines Kufr in, in a number of ways, but ultimately he sees it as arrogant opposition to God's commands, especially his commands to care for the poor and needy. Isaac and other contemporary thinkers, such as Khaled Abdel Fadl and Abdul Karim Sarush, emphasize the limitations of the medium of language in conveying God's intentions in the Quran. And here I will refer to the, 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 um, their book about the unlimited horizons of, interpreting, of, of interpreting the text. So you can see that the similarity there. They also, um, these contemporary thinkers also emphasize the role of the interpreter's historical and cultural context in determining the meaning of the text and argue that only God has the authority to know absolute truth so that the interpretive process can never be closed. Um, Abdul Karim Sarush has offered the boldest interpretation of the role of the prophet and hence of his cultural context in the production of the Quran. He says that revelation means inspiration, which came from the prophet's self, although that self was different from others because he had actualized the, the, his divine potential. So the implication is all humans have divine potential, the prophet had actually actualize it, which most of us do not. He ex Sarush explicitly draws from Sufi and Shi'i teachings, as well as Mu'tazili rationalism, in his explanation of this process. And he argues that the unavoidability of a plurality of religious interpretations and conceptions and sects implies that plurality itself is desirable. It's not a problem. And he says, uh, maybe rightful guidance is broader than we had imagined. Maybe salvation and felicity hinge on something beyond these antagonistic and divisive dogmas and particular conceptions. Khaled Abul Fadl is also explicitly informed by Sufi and Mu'tazili views. He writes, in order to create an adequate potential for the realization of a human rights commitment in Islam, it is important to visualize God as beauty and goodness, and that engaging in a collective act enterprise of beauty and goodness with humanity at large is part of realizing the divine in human life. Hence, justice and mercy are central to Islam. He draws on the Quran's celebration and sanctification of human diversity 
and its emphasis on the attainment of righteousness by competing for goodness, along with the Mottazli view that we innately know right from wrong, which is opposed to the more traditional Sunni belief that only God can know right from wrong and we can't know it unless he reveals that to us. Um, and Abul Fadl says that despite the fallibility of human interpretation, all human interpretation being fa fallible, he says the dignity of all human beings derives from the intellect, the human intellect, which he calls the microcosm of the abilities of the divine self. Hence, human beings are a potential symbol of divinity. This idea of the human potential for the realization of divine attributes is well known in the writings of Ibn al-Arabi and is echoed in Sufi poetry and philosophical writings. I mention these other thinkers to demonstrate the commonalities between the ESSER's approach and those of other progressive Muslim thinkers. Like Sarush and Abul Fadl, the ESSER embraces a combination of Sufism and rationalism that enables them to reject dogmatism. They find in the concept of the original religion of humanity, Deen al-Fitra, a ground for the acceptance of all religions and embrace a Sufi humility and enlightenment that provide the grounds for peace. They employ a combination of new interpretations of the Quran and Sunnah and Sufi spirituality to create a system, a spiritual system that promises the regeneration of the self in a divine mold, which enables them to engage with others in a spirit not only of peace, but of love. Finally, I would like to address the question of the relevance of the ESSER's approach for contemporary Muslim societies. Egyptian society and Arab society in general has become much more complex and differentiated over the last few decades. We see simultaneous trends toward hardened Salafism and bold new interpretations of Islam. Toward the end of his book, Islamism, a, political, a history of political Islam from the fall of the Ottoman Empire to the rise of ISIS, Egyptian journalist Tariq Osman evaluates the future of Islamism in the Arab world. He writes, across the Arab world, demographics, economics, and urbanization are increasingly transforming lives. Not many young Arabs are willing to accept blind obedience to authority, whether religious or secular. Across the Arab world, we are now seeing large groups of young Muslims who are increasingly open to innovative understandings of Islam. There is a notable revival of Sufism in North Africa and the Gulf. Many youth groups in countless internet chat rooms and on Facebook pages are discovering marginal, often esoteric, schools of Islamic theology. Some are coming up with their own interpretations of what Islam as a faith means to them. So, he says, religious groups that aim to play a leading role in their country's public lives need to be open to different ideas and to be flexible in the way that they respond to people and groups with whom they disagree on key issues such as belief. Um, and he, he, he says, the more the Islamists cling to a victimization narrative, coalesce around a desire for revenge and demonize large social groups, um, the more they will become detached from some of the most interesting developments in Islamic thought. Well, if Osman is right, then the approach of the ESSCR may fit in well with the orientation and aspirations of many educated youths in Egypt. It has abandoned the traditional sheikh-disciple relationship and all authoritarian forms of leadership. It espouses a humble, open orientation that, of course, is quite a contrast to the self-righteousness and exclusivism of Salafis. It engages thoughtfully with the Islamic intellectual tradition in a way that is consistent with the best aspects of Islamic modernism and contemporary progressive interpretations. And it promotes social activism that deals with real problems of poverty and social inequality. For all these reasons, it offers an alternative that can appeal to educated Muslims who are seeking to practice Islam in ways that are spiritually satisfying and to interpret Islam in ways that affirm uh, more liberal values. 
The spiritualist dimensions of the group's origins are not denied, but neither are they practiced. Spiritualism, which appealed to many educated Egyptians in the early and mid 20th century, does not, to my knowledge, resonate strongly with educated Egyptians today. And if any of you know differently, I'd be very happy to, to learn from you. Spiritualism's implicit acceptance of the transmigration of souls also opens it to accusations of blasphemy. On the other hand, the ESSCR's language, platform, and pluralism allow it to link to similarly socially active progressive forms of spiritual spirituality all over the world without becoming a satellite of Western organizations. In an increasingly globalized world in which no culture is an island, this is likely to enhance the group's legitimacy and prestige, as we have seen in Alia and Aisha's numerous interviews and appearances in the Egyptian media. Although Ali Rafa is the acknowledged leader of the group and his teachings are more readily available on YouTube, it is these two sisters who have been sought out by public organizations of various types to articulate the application of their spiritual view to the social issues of today. This interesting confluence of Islam, universalist spirituality, social activism, and feminism may never become a mass popular movement, but it can certainly serve the aspirations of a significant segment of educated Egyptians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Valerie Hoffman, for that fascinating talk. And we are ready for Kamal Gassimov, who is from the Department of Middle Eastern Studies. He will give the response. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hoffman. Uh, it was a very thought-provoking presentation, and I personally learned a lot of uh, new information uh, uh, and new topics uh, about Sufism and contemporary Egypt. So I have uh, several, uh, um, it made me think about several relevant, and I suppose, important topics. The first, the narrative about Said Rafi and his neo-Sufi movement shows a constant and enduring conversations that Muslim, Muslims had with and have with their tradition. The flexibility and hermeneutical richness uh, of the Islamic discursive tradition, which produces very interesting interpretations, uh, even in the context of modernization and the emergence of new religious movement. For example, uh, Muhammad Rafi employs this concept, as Professor Hoffman uh, mentioned, Din al-Fitra, the, the uh, natural and primordial predisposition of, of uh, people towards the, the God, uh, the internal knowledge um, which people have from their, uh, fr from their childhood. Uh, and this concept is, um, was used by Ibn Sina, Al-Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, until the Nahda period, uh, by Muhammad Ibn Ashur, uh, and uh, many other Muslim scholars. So uh, it's interesting how this new Sufi movement fluctuating between uh, the, the new trends, new intellectual trends of the 20th century, and also it employs the Islamic archive, and it uses use a Quranic concept, because the Din al-Fitr is itself a Quranic concept, but it has a basis in the Quran, that all people have internal disposition, the knowledge about God, and then when they grow up, they choose different religions. Uh, um, the second interesting issue, Professor Hoffman mentioned the hagiographic nature of the official biography of Said, uh, uh, of Said uh, Rafi, uh, which is like he was a descendant of the Prophet, he, was, uh, he had exceptional personal virtues from his childhood. From when he was uh, 20 days old, he, can, he, he, he focused on his mother's face. And all this stuff, all this information, all these uh, um, uh, topics uh, you can find in every medieval Sufi uh, biography of any medieval Sufi sheikh. And the question, question is, what is biography here and what is uh, centuries old Sufi topos? Uh, because um, especially I'm interesting, uh, it was very interesting to know that the visionary experience that he had, and the, that he was educated, and he proclaimed his own personal master, a illiterate Shazali ascetic. And this is also a topos, uh, the, the, the learned man, educated man, he studies under the illiterate sheikh, like from the early harbingers of the Sufism, like Abu Yazid al-Bistami, who had the Sufi of 18th century, who had um, Abu Ali Sindi, the person uh, who chose as his teacher, Abu Ali Sindi, who didn't know Arabic, he was completely illiterate. And even Imam Shafi it said that he was a student of a shepherd who, who taught him how to behave uh, in public and uh, 
even the Jaladin Rumi proclaimed his, his Sheikh illiterate uh, Ma, uh, Salahaddin Zarkoub and others. So you have this topos and these ideas. And what is important that even in the 20th century, the contemporaries, uh, the masters, the Sufis, they use these uh, idioms, which are recognizable idioms. It means that people understand them. They, they these idioms attract them. And they still, uh, during the centuries, these idioms are used today and they um, like mm, uh, involve people to, into con conversation. Uh, also what is uh, interesting, the, the process, what Mark Sedwick calls it, uh, new age, the eclecticism of new age Sufism. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating how this Sufism is situates itself between different, within different traditions. So it's spiritualism, spiritism, theosophy, and also uh, Islamic archive, for example, uh, on one particular moment, you start thinking that, oh, it's nothing to do with the Sufism. It's completely like new contemporary yoga movements or some kind of spiritual uh, move. But then he gives uh, interpretation of Islamic practices like a salah, al qibl, al tawaf, and he used exactly the same interpretation that you can find in every classical Sufi treatise. So the power of these Sufi archives that it, you even in the context of globalized uh, capitalism, you cannot escape this archive. You, can, you still utilize it, you still use it, and uh, you produce very unexpected uh, interpretations. The second issue, what I wanted uh, to, to, to just, uh, I was uh, very interested, and uh, I, I think I, I, I should tackle it, that uh, you, 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 Professor Hoffman mentioned in, your, in her paper that uh, the, the, the Alia, daughter of Muhammad, she criticized the Islamism and rigidness of today's contemporary Egypt. But sometimes uh, what we see is that uh, the, 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 it resembles a lot of new movements, liberal and leftist movements, contemporary Egypt, who criticize and blame Islamism for every evil in the country. And sometimes they became that like a tool in the, in the and the, at the same time they ignore the main, one of the main reason and cause why Islamism became so popular, why, why Islamism became the only choice and why Islamism is, became radicalized and went underground. So they usually ignore the government, the role of the government, the, the uh, authoritarianism. And uh, sometimes Muslims are uh, encouraged to be peaceful and uh, they talk, sometimes they, they encourage to promote Sidim and uh, Salam, but at the expense of the justice. There couldn't be peace without good governments, accountable governments, the freedom of speech, academic freedoms, and other stuff. But a lot of movements, even reformist movements today, criticizing too much Islamism, they ignore the, the, the power structures who promote actually this Islamism, who involve them into the parliament, misuse the, uh, these kinds of these groups. And I'm just interested how they position itself, this, uh, this family, because what it seems is clear that they have connection with the, fa with the government and uh, they have a public space where to present their uh, teachings. And, but at the same time, they are very critical about, of Islamism without, without talking about the government, the contemporary Egypt situation in contemporary Egypt. And this is, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kamal, for that thoughtful and energetic response. I'm sure that Professor Hoffman and Kamal are um, ready for questions. Because uh, nothing Sufi is, oh, Sufi is alien to me. I was particularly <laughs> interested <laughs> um, in uh, Valerie Hoffman's presentation. Um, and it is fascinating. Definitely, you see parallel developments in other areas. So it is uh, definitely representative of a trend. How we designate it, it's very interesting. Should we call it neo-Sufism? non-denominational Sufism, perennialist Sufism, or uh, we, sh we should find a different, uh, more accurate definition. I don't know, I, I just suggest this for, for a discussion, maybe during our uh, last meeting at the end of the conference. What is, uh, uh, what is particularly interesting in the, this whole uh, development uh, with the Rafi uh, spirituality is everything begins in Egypt. The per perennialism, uh, Ivan Agieli comes to study in Egypt, finds a local sheikh, Elish, I think was his name, or Alish, uh, 
and uh, but he already is uh, burdened with this European cultural uh, mm, cultural situation that reflects uh, spiritual quests in Europe uh, at, uh, and in the United States at that time. So his uh, version of Sufism, uh, he, which he transmits then to the next receiver uh, and disseminator, Genon, René Genon, and then Genon transmits it to Schuon. Uh, Schuon institutes in Bloomington, Indiana, the Maria Mia Brotherhood, which uh, combines worship of sun, uh, Indian dances, traditional dances, uh, the cult of Mary as the foundation of all existence, that was his, uh, plus uh, some elements of Buddhism and uh, uh, Hinduism and Christianity. It's all very, very eclectic. So, uh, but interestingly, uh, Professor Hoffman talks about Egypt, and Egypt is the origin of that, now, which is very f befitting because it's an ancient country uh, where everything originates. But it kind of comes full circle. Then it again revives, is revived by the founder of this movement with all these eclectic elements. So that's what I found um, fascinating and uh, interesting. Um, I don't know, uh, Muhammad Abdo was a reformer, but he didn't particularly, I, I, I don't think he would have approved the focus on spirituality, uh, non-denominational <laughs> spirituality especially. Okay. Yeah, he was more in favor of activism uh, in this life and here and now. Thank you. I really agree with, is this on? Yeah, I agree with you, and of course, you know, Masar Omad Dunya, so of course everything begins in Egypt, right? <laughs> well, um, th thank you so much, uh, Valerie. You've taken us in so many uh, important uh, uh, back alleyways of uh, modern um, uh, Muslim spirituality. Um, I should confess, I, I wrote my MA thesis at AUC on Rafa'a Tahtali. And uh, although he has been appropriated for purposes of Muslim modernism on the whole and by and large, uh, it may be interesting to note that uh, I found that he often cited uh, uh, Sha'rawi, uh, the medieval Sufi, Abdul Wahab Sha'rawi, uh, for even for political economy. Uh, and he was obviously very versed. I mean, he was a Sufi, as everybody really of his generation was. But he was very versed in, uh, in Sha'rawi's, in, in medieval sort of uh, Egyptian Sufi thought. And he combined it with an interest in the Sansimonians, uh, who also spiritualized political economy. And uh, so the, th this uh, family has been doing this for a while. <laughs> This is what I would argue. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised but what the daughters know, I mean the descendants know, have read uh, Tahalali and are aware of his. And, and he also, because he was kind of a Sansimonian, he predicted that uh, the world would be united by the Suez Canal and the transcontinental railway in the United States. Uh, so um, I, I don't know, I wonder if there's not a tradition of kind of cosmopolitan uh, spirituality there, which is interested in these currents abroad as well as uh, as, as their Egyptian uh, heritage. Um, but um, I wanted to ask you more about uh, a figure that uh, you brought up uh, and who seems to be pretty important, but then uh, subsided, which is uh, Silver Branch, uh, Sil Silver Birch, uh, and um, that. What do you th do? You think that the Aside from it just being part of Western spiritualism, uh, what do you think that the connection to the Native Americans, does it have an anti-imperial overtone? Or what does it mean for these Egyptian spiritualists uh, to have Native American uh, practices in their, in their background? 
That is such a good question. I wish I knew the answer. It's, you know, I found lots of websites of people who are still totally inspired by Silver Birch, you know, in the US and in England. And so uh, there, I do find it very curious that there are these two Native American spirits. I also kind of wondered about that, but I don't even know how to, where to begin to explore it. It's a, it's a really good question. I wish I had an answer. And uh, which is also interesting that the same tradition, uh, even in the 16th century Egypt, and he has a very pluralistic uh, concept of Islamic law, v much more, much more pragmatic than the Shatibis, which is popular today, and Maqast and Shari, much more. But I don't know why, because of maybe the bias of reformist Islam towards Sufism somehow made uh, this concept so neglected. And uh, But uh, he is really relevant for today, for, for now. It's not just a Zavi, a Sufi Zavi, not just about spirituality, but to making the Islamic law easier to the people. This is what. Well, thank you. Uh, I apologize if you've already answered. Well, you've said this because I came late uh, to this presentation. But I was interested in um, if you have any thoughts on Khalid Abu al Fadl's maybe understanding of what Professor Nish uh, talked about, the tripartite um, division of where people are located in terms of their spirituality or spiritual capacity, um, you know, the ordinary and then the yeah. khawas and then the khusus al khusus, is, is that what you called it, Professor Nish? Yeah. Um, I wonder what, what he, I mean, I've, I've read some of his work, but not a whole lot, I mean, if, uh, if, if it's possible for you to think. And I, I know one, one other thing that I, I want to say is that uh, you said he, he does, he is informed by Mu'tazili thought, but he has some really fascinating um, insights into uh, how, how to understand the text, you know, of the Quran. And then, you know, his famous uh, quote that I love uh, is that in regard to every ethical obligation, Oh, okay. How is this now? Better. <laughs> <laughs> so Khalid Abu al-Fadl has this uh, comment in one of his books, I think maybe more than one, in regard to every ethical um, uh, concept or understanding, the text assumes that the reader will bring an innate sense of morality or some, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. So the text will morally enrich the reader only if the reader will morally enrich the text. And I've, uh, I've you know, thought about that you know, passage many times. He didn't say that the text will intellectually enrich the reader if the reader will bring an intellectual sense to the text. Mm -hmm. It's moral. And that is very telling. So, but that's a separate comment. You know. Thank you. He never, um, Abul Fadl never explicitly talks, you know, he certainly doesn't use the terms, you know, the commoners, or you know, al al amab al khasa, or khasa al khasa, and all that. That he doesn't. But um, on the other hand, he, you know, I I think there is a kind of tension in his writings. I've read his two huge books, the ones that I had on my <laughs> slide. I've you know even taught them in my class, so I had to read them very carefully. But I think there is a um, a tension between, on the one hand, his insistence on the openness of the text and the participation of the reader in forming the meaning of the text, and on the other hand, he is clearly opposed to, as he says, every person just sort of arrogating to him or herself the authority to interpret and going online and spreading things, and his listing of all of the um, qualifications of the interpreter, of the faqih, uh, would be pretty daunting for most people. And so ultimately, I don't feel like he really answers the question of who really 
can we allow to interpret? I think he's most concerned with preventing uh, people from usurping God's authority, basically, in, in, in approaching the text. Um, yes, indeed, I, I agree with you that he has that. Um, there are aspects of what he has to say that are very Sunni, you know, absolutely very Sunni. He's constantly quoting the idea that every mujtahid is correct and the different ideas about what does that mean. Does it mean that there is one correct answer and we won't know till the day of judgment or does it mean there's no really correct, you know, all of that. That's a very Sunni approach, and since I'm now very immersed in the world of Ibad the Islam, they totally reject this idea that every mujtahid is correct. But on the other hand, um, you know, his, his insistence on uh, that we can know, we can know right from wrong, and, and, um, and his criticism of the tradition for squashing the there are innate knowledge, uh, a, a moral sense. I also think his insistence that he has the right to what he calls a conscientious pause. Um, when he encounters a text, even a text of the Quran that violates his sense of beauty and justice and mercy, um, such as, you know, the one that allows a husband to discipline his wife, physically even. Um, he, he says, ultimately, he allows himself a conscientiousness pause. In other words, he just sort of feels like, okay, that I, I reserve the right not to immediately take the apparent meaning of that text as, as really what God meant. And so his insistence on I, I actually think he's wonderful in, in his analysis of, I mean, he brings in all of the, the modern, um, all modern scholarship on how one approaches a text and what is the role of the reader in, in um, establishing the meaning of a text, really in the, even what he calls the authorial process. Um, I, all of that I really think is very good, but I think there are some things that ultimately are unanswered. And, um, I read his, his, also his book, um, The Conference of the Books, Searching for Beauty in Islam, and it's a very sort of personal reaction to texts, but ultimately he doesn't try to, you know, to exegete any of them and say this is, you know, this is how I understand this text, which is, it's more just a kind of ad hoc exploration, which I kept wanting him to be clear how do you interpret this text? What do you think this means? And he seems to refuse to do that, which I think is, is an interesting thing. So is it open? Yes, it's infinitely open to interpretation. Can anyone approach the text? It's, I think he would say, yes, but you should be humble in your approach to the text. You should recognize what you don't know. You should recognize that you can never know for sure that your interpretation is correct and you should not be authoritarian in imposing any particular interpretation on others. Thank you very much, Professor Hoffman and Kamal Gassimov for that wonderfully enriching um, contribution and discussion. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much. And